Good morning, everybody. My name is Bob. Uh, in the interest of full disclosure, that was kind of half the story about why I'm here. It is true that Naomi Shihab Nye knows me, but what she knows more is actually my wife, uh, who, they're, they're both poets. My wife is a singer-songwriter named Eliza Gilkison. And so I'm here on the coattails of someone far more talented. I'm the B team. So I, I don't, I've learned long ago that as a speaker, my first job is to lower your expectations. <laughs> That usually works to my advantage. Actually, I, I, the poem you read uh, of Naomi's really struck me because, although we didn't talk about it ahead of time, the invocation of sorrow was appropriate to what I want to speak to today. And that reminded me of one of my favorite songs of my wife's, uh, in which she writes, uh, and it doesn't, I can't do justice to it speaking it, so bear with me, but there's a song in which she writes, those are lost who try to cross through the sorrow fields too easily. And that's really what I want to talk about, uh, what it means to walk through the sorrow fields today, these days. Um, and the term I tend to use is not sorrow, but grief. So I guess uh, I'm your self-appointed grief counselor today. <laughs> not grief for the individual sorrows that we feel, which are of course inevitable, but grief on a, a larger scale, kind of on a planetary scale. It reminds me of another, uh, a line from another of my favorite writers, Wendell Berry, who in his book, Unsettling America, um, talks about recognizing that we live on the human estate of grief and joy. And the poets have long reminded us that if you want to embrace the joy of living, of being alive, you cannot avoid the grief. Uh, my wife is good on the joy part. I'm the grief specialist. That's, uh, I'm from North Dakota. It's where our minds tend to go, if anybody knows the terrain and weather of North Dakota. Uh, what I want to talk today about is um, what a good friend of mine described as the multiple cascading ecological crises of our day. The multiple cascading ecological crises. Now, for those of us old enough to remember the beginnings of the environmental movement, we're used to talking about environmental problems. Yes, I was born in 1958, Rachel Carson's famous book, Silent Spring, in 64, and we started to think about ecolo or environmental problems, right? You have a river that's dirty, you have a city that has smog, right? there's a chemical contamination from a, a factory. We tended to think of discrete environmental problems with the assumption that those discrete problems had solutions. You go in and you clean up the river. You clean up the smog. You clean up the chemicals. That, I think, is an inadequate way of thinking about the world. Instead, we should be thinking about multiple cascading ecological crises, plural. Large-scale crises, many of them in front of us, cascading, I emerging in ways that we cannot predict. What I'm talking about is, in a sense, just paying attention to the data, the evidence around us. Right. that if we look at any measure of the health of the ecosphere, right, the planet, any measure of the health of the ecosphere, if you actually look at the data, the news is bad and getting worse at a more rapid rate than we imagined. Now, the one we hear the most about, of course, is climate change, and that's serious business. But it's not just climate change. Think about groundwater contamination and problems with the hydrological cycle. Being from North Dakota, an agricultural state, I think a lot about topsoil erosion. We are eroding topsoil at rates rapidly beyond replacement level. Chemical contamination, not only of specific rivers or lakes, but of all of the planet, including 
deeply in our own bodies. And then the question of biodiversity, the rapid extinction of species, so great now that people are calling it the great, sixth great extinction. You look across the board and the news is bad. The news is getting worse. And if you believe, as I do, there are biophysical limits to the planet and that we are bound by them, I would say that's a rational assessment, then it's hard not to feel a sense of fear about what might be happening already and what might be coming. And that's why I say, in, in a phrase I'm fond of using, if we're paying attention, we are all apocalyptic now. Brothers and sisters, I know you're a secular group here, but we are in Texas. No. We are all apocalyptic now. If we're paying attention, we should all be thinking apocalyptically. Now, unfortunately, that term in pop culture has come to be associated with theological fantasies of the end of days and a rapture and the chosen being lifted up. I'm not talking about the apocalypse in that sense. I'm talking about it, I think, in its more basic sense. The word apocalypse from the Greek, revelation is the Latin, they both mean the same thing. They don't mean the end of the world. They mean a lifting of the veil so that we may see more clearly. It's a recognition of uh, an awareness when we talk about thinking apocalyptically. And not the end of the world, but a recognition that we are reaching the end of the systems that structure our world. And we're used to thinking about systems in the realm of social justice, thinking about, for instance, white supremacy and the need to transcend white supremacy if we are going to create a world that's based on the moral principles we claim to hold. We think about patriarchy and institutionalized male dominance and transcending that. We think about the problem of inequality that comes with contemporary capitalism. But the other system we need to think about transcending is the modern industrial worldview, the embrace of high energy, high technology, the system that is, in fact, accelerating that bad news on the ecological front. So I think it's a good thing to think apocalyptically in that other sense of the word and to recognize that if we are going to take the data seriously and recognize there are biophysical limits to the planet and we are bound by them, then we have to confront the most dangerous fundamentalism currently threatening not only the United States but the world. This is Celebration Circle, yes? Eclectic, thoughtful, spiritual. So certainly there are no fundamentalists in the room, correct? But I'm not talking about religious fundamentalism. Religious fundamentalism is dangerous, whether it's Christian fundamentalism, uh, Islamic fundamentalism, uh, the fundamentalism you see in Judaism, in Hinduism, even in Buddhism. Now, I knew the world was in trouble when I was reading about Southeast Asia and realizing there are fundamentalist Buddhists. That just is not heartening. <laughs> you always had hope that at least the Buddhist would stay stained, but there are societies in which all of those fundamentalisms are loose and they're dangerous. There's also a kind of economic fundamentalism at loose in the world, the assumption that contemporary corporate capitalism is the only way you can organize an economy. In the United States, we're well familiar with a kind of national fundamentalism, often called American exceptionalism, this idea that we are the ordained righteous force in the world. All of those are fundamentalisms that are dangerous, but in some ways I think the most dangerous fundamentalism is what some of us are starting to call technological fundamentalism. When confronted with the data about the health of the ecosphere, which is difficult to grasp and process, many people take a fundamentalist escape route a technological fundamentalism that says whatever problems we face, we can solve with high energy, high technology. And the most interesting part of this fundamentalism 
is that that faith in high energy, high technology to solve all our problems includes solving the problems that were caused by previous versions of high energy, high technology. And more and more, there are people thinking about other ways. But that technological fundamentalism really does have a grip on the culture that we need to break. If you doubt this, if you think I'm just making stuff up, uh, a recommendation that go online and look up something called the Eco-Modernist Manifesto. Eco-Modernist, Eco-Modernism. It's a document that came out about a year ago from well-known environmentalists, people who are associated with the environmental movement. Not the Koch brothers, not the Cato Institute, right? but people who came out of the environmental movement. And they tell us not to worry about the data because we will solve these problems with technology. Going so far as to say that eventually we can continue to maintain unlimited economic growth through a process they call decoupling. We're going to decouple. We're going to decouple economic growth from the material world in which we live. These are the kinds of fantasies that are in the mix out there as people have a hard time coming to terms with the data. And that's why I think an important part of this process is to recognize that if we are going to take the world seriously, there is a grieving process for what has been lost and what likely will be lost. Now, for me, uh, there is you know, a, a resistance to that. I don't want to believe that. But I came to understand the importance of this through a close friend of mine, a man named Jim Coplin, who none of you should know, because uh, he's not from San Antonio, and he was not prominent. Uh, Jim was a, a longtime friend of mine, probably my closest friend, and he's the man from whom I got that phrase, multiple cascading ecological crises. And for years, Jim helped me come to terms with this, right, to figure out what we're going to do about this. And the first step, he always said, was grieving. And long ago, maybe 20 years ago, Jim told me, he said, I wake up every morning in a state of profound grief. Right. Now, by that, he didn't mean he was depressed or the added problems in his own personal life that led to the grieving. He was talking about waking up and being aware of the health of the larger living world and grieving that every day. Okay. Now, for some people, that grieving could be a dead end, an excuse for paralysis. But the importance of my friend Jim was not only how he helped me understand it, but what kind of model he provided for me. Because although Jim Coplin said he woke up every day in a state of profound grief, he also woke up, woke up every day and got to work. When I met him, he was a retired university professor who could have easily lived comfortably on a pension Yet every day he went to work, not for money, but to deal with that grief. He did not deal with his grieving by removing himself from the world, but by, in fact, injecting himself into that world every day. He was engaged in a variety of political movements over the years, recognizing that we should be trying to change the course of our society. And he was also involved in what we might generally call deep community building, recognizing that whatever happens politically, we have to build the kinds of connections at the local level that can sustain us. And for him, that meant connections not only to other people, but connections to the land. He was a farm boy who remained a master gardener throughout his life. So I, I think that my job these days in settings like this is to simply say out loud what is often on the minds and in the hearts of people. The problem is when we feel these things, when we think these things, and we try to bring them up at a dinner party, let's say, 
Admittedly for me, this is hypothetical because I have not been invited to a dinner party in many years for reasons that are now probably self-evident. But if I were to be, you know, I can imagine these things. If I were to be an invited to a dinner party, I can imagine that trying to articulate this kind of feeling is often going to be met with resistance. People shut you down. They push back. They make a joke. They move on. They talk about the NBA finals, right, or whatever is going on these days. Did I get the sport right? <laughs> I, I have a hard time keeping up sometimes, but I think those are still going on. So my job, it seems to me, is not to tell you anything you don't know, but simply to remind you that it is okay to think and feel what you may be thinking and feeling, and that Whatever we know about grief, we know that grief is best dealt with communally. Grief is very hard to deal with is in isolation, whether we're grieving the loss of a loved one or something bigger. And so the only thing I'm really offering you is permission to feel and think what you think and feel. Right? And recognize that you are not alone in that. The the comfort that I got from my relationship with Jim Copland was so important to me that um, I actually wrote a book about it and Jim is the subject and my relationship with Jim is the subject of Plain Radical. Um, Jim died mm, going on three years ago now. Uh, when he was alive, he would never let me write about him or write with me. He issued the sort of public realm like that the only thing that was positive about his death is he was not around to stop me from writing about him anymore. And the book draws from several thousand pages of correspondence that flowed between Jim and I during his life. And it's an attempt to make sense of these forces that structure the world we live in. Well, review them, white supremacy, patriarchy, capitalism, imperialism, right? paying attention to the systems within the human family that prevent us from being truly free. And also an awareness that whatever problems we have within the human family, the human family is fallen out of right relationship with the larger living world. And that both of those concerns must go forward. Now, so that I don't end completely on such a somber note, Jim would be the first to say, no matter what is possible over the long run, whether we're gonna get out of this or not, there is always work that can be done in the world. Right? And again, that can be in politics, it can be in the community. I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that I think are really quite inspiring. One is, uh, the food movement, right? So we think sometimes of the food movement or of foodies as simply, you know, middle-class white people who want to make sure they have a steady supply of organic tofu. But the food movement is much more than that. There's a vibrant food justice movement in the United States thinking about food not only in the context of ecological realities but social inequalities. Worldwide, there's a larger food sovereignty movement going even beyond the concept of food justice and asking, can people truly be free if they do not control their own food supply? There's some really vibrant things going on in the world around the question of food, and Jim was very, very central. That was very central in Jim's life. The other movement I'm familiar with is the, the larger cooperative movement, especially the worker cooperative movement. Right? People coming together recognizing the profound injustice in contemporary capitalism and its fundamental unsustainability and forming new ways to engage in economic activity. Worker cooperatives are worker-owned, worker-managed businesses. And there's a vibrant worker cooperative movement, again, not only in the United States, but worldwide. Right? And so, although there's plenty of reasons for grief, there is, as I think this community is dedicated to, also an awareness that there is always within us reasons to be joyful. That the grief is half 
of the human estate, and we shouldn't forget that. Still, I think it's important not to sugarcoat the, the way we think about this. And so I'm going to close with a quote uh, from Dostoevsky's famous novel, The Brothers Karamazov. Now, I feel compelled to say I haven't read the whole book. <laughs> you know, there's this tendency to want to show how smart you are by quoting dense Russian novels that almost nobody's read. I have read the whole book. It's long, for God's sake. Have you seen the thing? <laughs> Hard to follow. <laughs> but there is a, a, a portion of it that I have read, and it, I was spurred to go find it by a quote uh, which comes at the end of this passage. And I think it helps put these questions in perspective. So it's, it's the advice being given to one of the characters. And I'll end on this. If you do not attain happiness... Always remember that you are on the right road and try not to leave it. Above all, avoid falsehood, every kind of falsehood, especially falseness to yourself. Watch over your own deceitfulness and look into it every hour, every minute. Avoid being scornful, both to others and to yourself. What seems to you bad within you will grow purer from the very fact of your observing it in yourself. Avoid fear, too, though fear is only the consequence of every sort of falsehood. Never be frightened at your own faint-heartedness in attaining love. Don't be frightened overmuch even at your evil actions. I'm sorry I can say nothing more consoling to you. For love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared with love in dreams. And thinking about Josh's performance in the song, always love, but a love that is honest, that faces that world that we must face. So my final words from Dostoevsky, remember that love in action is a harsh and dreadful thing compared with love in dreams. Thank you.